Hi and welcome to part two of the My Stalker story time which involves myself, Tallulah Lagash and Chad, the stalker. So part one describes how I first met Chad when I was his lawyer in the criminal defence solicitors Farmer Fish where I worked as a paralegal and a prison law advocate. I also then moved forward six years to 2012 when I'm approached by Chad at a bus stop who is telling me that he is not the same person that I believe I have previously met. I asked him his name and his first name was the same. I then asked him if he had ever been a client of Farmer Fish, which put him on guard, leading to him giving me a false last name. Now, my real last name is incredibly unusual. You will probably hear it once, unless you search the name online. But meeting people in reality, you're unlikely to meet two people with the same or similar last name as myself, particularly since my name is double barreled my real last name, and is um, an ethnic last name. So not only is it um, a name that you don't often hear outside of my um, family's home country but also the fact that it's double barreled means that it's combined two names through marriage making it even more rare chad did not ask me my last name during our first interaction as far as i can recall but he would have probably remembered my last name and that would have put him on notice. Now, when I get home, I don't have a good data plan on my mobile phone. I don't even think I had a data plan. I think I was just having to buy credit and use it for the internet. I didn't have a smartphone. It was just a phone that could access the internet via an app. And he had no social media profiles that I could find. I didn't do very much intense research on him because I didn't have very good internet connection living at my nan's. I didn't have a laptop. So after checking whether he was on social media using the name that he gave me, and I can't remember the fake last name he gave me, and his real name as I recalled from him being a client of Farmer Fish, there was nothing, no results. Now, the first initial contact that I had with Chad, and this being one of the specimen counts on the indictment that I mentioned, where I just collect together the patterns and trends of behaviour rather than going blow by blow each incident as an individual event, he would text me and call me. He didn't have me on any social media, as I say, because I wasn't using the internet that much. And also, I couldn't find that he was on social media in the first place. So it would always be via phone call or um, regular SMS and it would occur sporadically. So it could be a few times a week or it could be every other week or every other month for quite a long period of time, to be honest. And I was always very clear when Chad was trying to approach me in a romantic or sexual way that I just was not interested in him in this capacity. I gave him a number of excuses where I honestly told him that I was still getting over the breakup with my ex-boyfriend, Pedro, and that I wasn't sure if I was going to get back with Pedro. I was still seeing Pedro casually um, and very confusingly at this point in my life. I was returning to study. I was still coping with um, recovering from mental health issues, and I just wasn't looking to date anybody. And I did tell him that we could be friends and he would accept this, but then he would still approach me again as if he'd forgotten that he was very firmly in the friend zone. This kind of behaviour happened for around about a year and a half. And I could have blocked him, but I chose not to. Another mistake. One notable incident involved him getting his friends um, to speak to me on the phone and try and convince me to give him a chance he was a nice guy he would treat me right what am i scared of and i 
told them exactly what I was telling Chad. I'm not interested at all. It's my friendship or nothing. And I guess I was making another mistake at this point because I could have confronted Chad about the fact I knew he'd been lying about his identity and that I did remember him, I did know him, I would still be friends with him knowing what I did know, but I wasn't happy with the lie. However, he was in a false sense of security because I did not mention it. And I do take responsibility for that fact. Chad also one time got his mum to speak on the phone and again tried to convince me to um, give her son a chance. Chad's mum did not mention that she might know me. I don't know whether Chad had confided in her as to the nature of our previous interaction back in 2006 or whether she was completely oblivious and just knew me by my first name, Tallulah, and wasn't at all complicit in that. I have no information. Again, I reiterated, I was not interested in him. Now, eventually, Chad seemed to accept that more and more because he realised that our interaction was probably dependent on him not harassing me to date him. And he would make um, offers to meet up as a friend. And I always refused. We now get into 2013 meet up and this was a mistake on my part i wanted to go to a club called mojo's which is a hip-hop club in my city there's no entry fee the drinks are pretty cheap the music is quite good and i can make requests to the dj i would often go alone and meet up with local friends if they were out there and they used to have rap battle competitions I used to take part in some of the rap battle competitions, freestyle um, contests. It was just a cool hangout. None of my friends that I'd met after returning to university and now moving onto campus to do a job um, in student welfare alongside my PhD wanted to go out to the club. Now, I'd only just met my friends, say, a couple of months or even less than that um, prior when we did our training together and none of my local friends were available to go out so I had the option of going by myself or trying to find someone to accompany me and stupidly because Chad had messaged me contemporaneous to this I decided that I would ask him if he wanted to go to the club. Chad of course said yes I reminded him it was as friends I just wanted to have a good night out and we could hang out together. He was accepting of that. I got the bus into the city and met him um, somewhere where he picked me up by car. I was annoyed that he'd decided to drive because I wanted to drink and I didn't want him to not enjoy himself if he wanted to drink too. He told me that he didn't want me to drink more than him, so I would be limited to the drink drive limit. I wouldn't have tried to force him to maintain the drink drive limit if he didn't want to. He's an adult. I would have advised him against it, but if he wanted to drink, he could have drunk. He made the choice not to, which was the sensible and legal choice, or at least to drink up to the safe drink drive limit, the legal limit. But... I wasn't happy that my drinking was going to be limited because I was trying to have a good night out and just to let my hair down and decompress and relax. But I reluctantly agreed. Now, there was one incident happening before we get into the club which set the night off onto bad vibes. Let's just say it involved parking. Chad couldn't find any free parking. I tell him where there is some parking close to the club, which I assume to be free. We go and check it out. He thinks that it's pay and display. I said I've seen a sign that suggests it's free. He argues with me. I'm not a driver, so I just relent. I tell him I will pay for the parking. He accepts. I pay for the parking. He then looks at the sign that I'd originally pointed out, and it was free parking. So, you know, that wasn't going down too well. He's looking tight, 
with his money in not wanting to pay for parking because I have paid for a bus ticket to get into the city and I was always planning on going back by bus or taxi so whatever we get to the club we both have two drinks let me just put it that way I buy both drinks I pay for mine and his two pints while I'm at the bar I get back to the table and Chad has a woman sitting on his lap crying. She is the friend of um, Chad via his close male friend, who's the boyfriend of this lady. This lady and the boyfriend, Chad's close mate, have had an argument that night and she is very upset about this and her and Chad decide that the best way to deal with this is to take some selfies of them together in the club with her sitting on his lap and then to send them to the boyfriend slash friend to make him jealous. I don't really care that this is happening because I'm not interested in Chad so what he does with any other woman in the club is completely his business but it's not the most entertaining scenario to be in particularly when I'm forcibly sober and Chad does not want to dance and I don't really want to go off by myself and dance on the dance floor it just seems like a weird night following the interaction with this woman she eventually goes and leaves us to it we have a bit of a chat it's so boring I ask if I can see Chad's driver's license or his ID he clocks why I'm asking him, undoubtedly, because he refuses to show me and says that his driving licence is in the car and he doesn't have any other form of ID on him. I could have asked to see a bank card, but obviously I'm not a private investigator or a police doing um, an interview um, under caution. I am there for a night out with this guy by choice. So although I am suspicious and prang as hell... I don't push it. We then leave after about two hours of sitting in a club and I make another mistake because I let Chad drive me home. Chad tells me that he's due at work for about 5am and he doesn't know what to do to kill the time. Should he go home and go to bed, bearing in mind it's already gone 1am? Should he hang out with me in my house and then leave for his shift and get changed at work? I want him to do the former, he wants to do the latter. I let him stay at my house for a couple of hours and about three o'clock he decides that his friend who is still awake, not the female friend from the club, um, another friend um, who is up and awake, he texts him and finds out that he's able to go over to his house. So he dusts and the next day he texts me and he is interested in me romantically and or sexually and again I have to make it clear that I am not interested in him and again I reiterate that I don't know where things stand with my ex-boyfriend Pedro and I'm not in the place to want to be dating anybody but in any event I see him as just a friend. It's so exhausting, it's like a broken record going back to the same point and it just being um, an obstacle to moving forward. We then have sporadic text communication and then I'm in my house one day, I'm using the landline and I'm dressed in a bath towel so I'm guessing a student called me and I rushed to get the phone. And Chad walks past my window. I'm at this point living in a house which is on the same road that I'm living in currently. So at the start of the video, you see um, in part one, me leaving my house. And that is the approximate area where I was living at the time. So there's a field in front of my lounge, living room, kitchen window. The windows are massive. They're almost floor to ceiling. And Chad is walking past outside my house. He stops and he waves at me. I kind of smile at him. And then when he stops and just starts staring in my window, I become quite intimidated by this. He hasn't texted me that day or 
anything to establish contact. So the fact that he's doing this outside my house randomly and it is on a university campus and he's not a university student. So although it's a public campus, I didn't really know his purpose for being there. And now he's right outside my window. Um, yeah, I find it intimidating. So I turn my back on him, I finish my phone call and then I leave the kitchen. Chad doesn't text me after that. Not straight away, anyway. The text communication really does dwindle at this point. But he's now being seen outside my house, looking in through my window and waving on a more regular basis. This could be on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, but it's a trend that's developing. And on each occasion, I would um, just leave the living room or kitchen area and I would then just wait until I thought a safe amount of time had passed and Chad had probably left the um, vicinity. One day I'm in my house and there's bang, bang, bang on the door and it's the kind of knock I'd expect from the police. If it's anybody that works on the campus, they would be able to have access to my house via like a key, a master key. So the fact that somebody is banging like this and I'm not expecting anyone at my house, nobody's contacted me, I am to kind of uh, put off answering it because of the like aggressiveness of the knock. And if it's the police and they have a warrant, then they can get security to come with them to gain access to my house if they need it. So I don't answer until one of my neighbours and colleagues texts me and says that there are men outside my house and am I okay? I decide to go and see who it is and I open the door and Chad is there with two henchmen. Henchmen looking like henchmen. And he asks me if I can get him any drugs. I tell him, no, I cannot. He knows that I smoke, but I'm not going to give him the numbers of anyone that I know. I don't want to involve myself in anything whatsoever. And I refuse to help him out there. He's then asking if he can come in my house. And why haven't I contacted him? Why haven't I um, just wanted to be around him? Bearing in mind, he hasn't been texting me. He's just been loitering outside my house, staring in my window and waving at me. I tell him I'm not interested and he has to leave. At this point, he is trying to persuade me, but his friends who realise that they've been duped into coming along for basically their friend to beg a um, reluctant woman to try and give him a chance at literally nothing because I've never led this man on. Um, I tell him to take his friend's advice and eventually he leaves. Another specimen count on the indictment, he would be around the university campus time and time and time again, sporadically. I would try and avoid him. He would never approach me unless we were in a confined space like the shop. If I did spot him, I'd either leave or I would, you know, just swerve him. If it was an open space like the centre of campus, he would holler at me. He'd shout, Tallulah, why are you ignoring me? Tallulah, come and speak to me. Tallulah, why are you being a bitch? Tallulah, I'm a nice guy. I just want to be friends. He would also ask constantly if I could get him drugs or help him find somebody who he could buy drugs off, which is the most bait thing ever, um, not just for myself, but for him as well. And he still wasn't texting or calling me. It was just these... Um, opportunistic meetings in my local um, area, the campus where I live. At some point, he then starts wearing a polo t-shirt, like a Fred Perry t-shirt, which indicated to me that he might have a job on campus, maybe in the sports park or something like that. Um, I never, ever found out, but also I just didn't want to interact with him. My main aim was to avoid him. I did a little bit of research on the internet and I did find an article in the news which was him in the local newspaper photographed with his name as I remembered it from 2006 saying that he'd done some charity work on a, a programme for ex-offenders where they could reintegrate into the community by um, you know, doing something 
that was pro-social. He worked in the charity shop. I found out that he had indeed been convicted of criminal offences, most likely the ones that he was on remand for when I was working at Farmer Fish. And so I didn't need to confront him. I had the evidence. I didn't want to establish any kind of conversation or dialogue with him. So there was no point trying to get this information out of him with the evidence, the receipts at this stage. I just didn't want any contact. Things came to a head when one day I came home to my house and remember he knows where I live. He is parked outside my house, just about one parking bay away from my front door. I go into my house, I wait for about 45 minutes. I think I'm getting ready to go out somewhere else because I need to leave again. And 45 minutes, maybe an hour passes and I think, that Chad must have left. There's no window at the front of my house where I could look out and see for sure. I had to open the front door in order to be able to see that's frosted. So um, yeah, it was kind of blind walking out into the little um, communal area where the car parking bays faced into, giving him full visibility. I walk out and he's still there. He has the window of his car wound down and as soon as he sees me he picks up his mobile phone and starts using it hands free as if he's timed it for my exit he wasn't on the phone to anybody it was just him um pretending just so that he could say something to a third party um he was alone in his car he wasn't talking to me but he wanted to talk about me in front of me and he starts saying to this hypothetical third party on his hands-free mobile phone conversation yeah she's come out of her house again the effing bitch she's a fucking slag she's a slut she's a whore she's a hoe she's fucking ignoring me i fucking hate her she fucking has so much fucking self-confidence she's so full of herself she thinks she's fucking better than me just ranting and raving in an entirely aggressive way. That is honestly the last close contact interaction I had with him. I walked away from that situation. I did see him on campus after then. This spanned the course of um, an additional two, three years up to about 2016 that I'd been seeing him on campus culminating in this incident um, when he was outside my house making this fake phone call. I could have told the authorities and that is a mistake in not doing so, but would I have done that now if it was happening in 2019? I'm not sure. I have this ridiculously high level of code where I don't want to snitch on somebody if I feel that I can manage the situation myself and I'm not endangered. He never seemed to place me in any physical endangerment. And while I know that I was harassed and that he broke the law and that he could potentially have been a dangerous person because of his background, I did make the decision not to seek um, any help from the authorities because I felt that I would jeopardise his liberty and his well-being in a way which was maybe um, disproportionate to how I felt I was managing the situation by myself. I never think that he ever realised the um, magnitude of the favour I did for him in that respect. He should be very grateful that the authorities didn't become involved because no doubt he would be imprisoned again or at least remanded because of, like I say, his background. And I do know that he has now got a daughter and that he seems to be a good dad from what I can see on the social media profile that I found of him. I haven't heard a peep out of him. I did tell one of my good friends about him and he knew of him and was friends with some of this guy's Chad's friends um, they had mutual friends in common and he said that he wanted to go and sort it out and I persuaded him not to do that I didn't want Chad to suffer any kind of violence or aggression from a third party in relation to a matter that I hadn't really taken any active steps other than avoiding him and making sure that all of our communication was limited to me either making it clear I didn't want any interaction if he approached me verbally in a public space or just removing myself from his vicinity at all other times. Yeah, that's the story of my stalker, Chad. 
and I haven't seen him in recent times. If I do, I'll do a little update video. I don't know if he ever was working on campus. Like I say, that was never ascertained. I have missed out a lot of details and just given you, like I say, the headlines of this story. I've combined several incidents where I say that he was outside my house staring him through my window and waving. There could have been approximately 20 to 30 um, of those interactions over the space of the three years when he would shout at me across the public areas of campus. That happened on at least 20 occasions as well over the three years. And... Um, he only came to my house on the two occasions and actively did something which felt very, very intimidating and threatening. The one when he turned up with his two friends, who, to be fair, didn't do anything other than stand around and then persuade him to leave. They didn't try to convince me that they should come in my house and they didn't put any pressure on me to, to do or say anything in that situation. I think they were just a bit embarrassed and ashamed of their wet white friend who thought he had street swagger, but actually, yeah was maybe a little bit of an incel and then like I say the culmination of our interactions where he's sitting outside my house talking to the hypothetical third party on his fake phone call let me know what you think of this story time in the comment section down below and let me know what you think of the wild vlogs I'm sorry it's become very dark my phone battery was starting to die and the flash turned off but this was a story time, so hopefully you've enjoyed listening to it. Please do subscribe to my channel, hit the notifications bell to be notified whenever I upload content onto my channel. Share my content if you think anyone will be entertained or amused by it. Check out the description box for my social media and also my blog, Viva Lagash. Give me a thumbs up, drop me a comment or a question, a suggestion or recommendation for content that you'd like to see on the Tallulah Lagash channel. Wow! That's my outro and I'll see you again on my next video, which may or may not be another wild vlog. Thank you so much for joining me today. See you soon, guys. Bye.